The following program will introduce an innovative and unique technology, broadcast teletext. The program will also include important technical tests never before performed in the United States. For the test to be successful, your assistance is necessary. To participate, please use the questionnaire located in the television section of this morning's Los Angeles Times. If the Los Angeles Times is not available, bring along a large piece of paper and simply follow directions provided in the program. <laughs> Hello, I'm Richard Jingris. We live in a world dominated by technological change. Every day we read about another revolution in technology. The information revolution, the computer revolution, the communications revolution. Of course, the world is not changing either as fast or as dramatically as many would have us believe. One need only recall past predictions of helicopters in every driveway and picture phones in every home to be knocked back to some sense of reality. Yet things are changing fast. No doubt all of us were equally startled and enthralled by the astounding array of miniature calculators and electronic games which have surfaced in the last few years. Our own business at KCET, the business of television, has witnessed more than its share of technological innovation in recent times. Satellites have dramatically altered the way we distribute programs around the country and cable television and subscription television have brought a new range of programming choices into many homes. There are also the many new home entertainment products which are being purchased in increasingly large numbers. I'm talking about large screen television projectors, video cassette players, and video discs which have entered the marketplace in the last two years. All are impressive pieces of technology. Tonight's program is about another technology one which could eventually be of far greater consequence than any I have mentioned, for it goes far beyond the addition of more program choices and beyond the ability to record and playback programs at one's own discretion. It's called broadcast teletext, and it has the potential to add a totally new dimension to television. Television will no longer be simply pictures and sound. Television with teletext has the potential to turn your set into an information resource. It has the potential to transform the way you relate to television from a passive experience to an active one. Imagine asking your television set a question. You're watching the evening news and Robin McNeil says that the national rate of unemployment was 6.2%. You wonder, how high was the rate of unemployment for California? Or more specifically, Los Angeles? You consult your TV set and it gives you the answer. The rate of unemployment for California, 5.8%. For Los Angeles, 6.1%. You're watching the San Diego Opera perform Merry Widow, and you'd like to know more about Beverly Sills. You ask your set, and there it is, a brief portrait of Sills right there on your screen. You're watching a Los Angeles Lakers basketball game. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is playing extremely well, and you're curious about his scoring statistics for the season. You press a few buttons, and the answer is yours. This and much, much more is possible with broadcast teletext, a technique which can send information and a variety of other services to you via the television signal without affecting the regular television picture. The possible applications are just about limitless and we'll take a closer look at some uses as we proceed through this program. We'll also show you how it works and tell you something more about its future. But first, let's take some time to begin the technical tests this program was primarily designed to accomplish. As one might imagine, there is currently tremendous interest in the development of teletext, interest emphasized by the number of national and international conferences and by the number of articles in major publications such as the one in this February 16th issue of TV Guide. Some proponents see it as a large source of revenue. Others admire its potential for valuable and sophisticated services. In order to design the most efficient system, we need to conduct this experiment. We might add that this is the first and only on-air teletext experiment in this country. And though, in taking part 
its purpose may seem insignificant to you, it is very important to the engineers and scientists involved in teletext design. During these tests, you'll not be seeing or experiencing teletext. This could not be done without the installation of a teletext decoder in your home. Nonetheless, the test does involve the transmission of teletext signals. But before we begin the test transmissions, we would like you to fill out the first section of the questionnaire, which was printed today as an ad in the television section of this morning's Los Angeles Times. The questionnaire is just like the one blown up behind me. For those who don't have the questionnaire, take a large piece of paper, write the questions down at the top as we ask them, and simply provide your answers. We will begin now by responding to the questions in this section, which will give us important information on the make and age of your television set. Your responses to the technical test will be of no value unless we know these key facts about your set. First, we need to know the make or brand of your set. For example, a Sony or an RCA. Fill in the make of yours. Second, we would like to know whether the set is color or black and white. Third, are you receiving KCET via an outdoor antenna like one on your roof, an indoor antenna like one which is simply attached to your TV set, or via cable TV? Fourth, and this is very important, when was your set purchased? If you can't remember exactly when, or if it, the set was bought secondhand, tell us the approximate age of the set, one or the other, but try to be as accurate as you possibly can. Fifth and last, what is the model number of your set? This is usually a combination of letters and numbers, and in some instances can be found embossed on your set. If you know it, please mark it down. If you don't know it, that's okay. It's not crucial. Your participation is still very valuable to us. Now let's move to the largest part of the questionnaire, this section here, which is designed for your responses to the technical tests. Again, for those without the questionnaire, list these 25 test periods and draw columns for your yes or no responses. The test periods will consist of a gray screen with white letters on it. Each period will be numbered. You look at your set and tell us by means of the questionnaire if during the test period you see something unusual on your screen. What we mean by unusual is, does your television's picture look anything out of the ordinary? For example, does the picture roll or are there any unusual lines in the picture? Please watch the set from your normal viewing position with the controls set as normal. The gray test picture will look a little dim. That's normal. What we are looking for is something not normally seen on your television picture. Your responses should be recorded on the questionnaire. As you can see, this box on the questionnaire is divided into five series of tests. Each of the series, just like those on your questionnaire, will be divided into five test periods. We will broadcast the first of the series in just a few seconds. It's really very simple. You'll have 10 seconds to respond to each test period. This test is not going to win you anything. As a result of your participation, you'll not get a boat or a winning ticket in the Irish sweepstakes or even a dinner with Alistair Cook. In fact, to be frank, it may seem a little odd to you, but take it from us. This is an important moment in the expansion of television's potential service to you and all other television viewers. The whole concept of right or wrong is irrelevant. We're interested in how your set in your home reacts to our tests. So let's begin. Remember, if you see something unusual, mark yes in the box. If you see nothing unusual, mark no. Test period number one. We have spent the first 10 minutes of this program telling you an awful lot about the potential impact of something you really haven't seen. Now we'd like to show some practical applications so you will also understand why this is so important to us and to you. This is a television set which is equipped to provide many of the services we have talked about. It's called a teletext decoder. It is a prototype and is only being used for test purposes. The decoder eventually available for home use will probably look like a normal set with additional equipment built in. Or you may be able to purchase an adapter which could be attached to your present set. 
the decoder is operated through this small handset or keypad, which looks very much like a small calculator. It is with this device that I can select and use a variety of services. Let's look at a fairly basic service, an information service, or what you might call an electronic magazine. Let's first look at the table of contents. As you can see, we can look at headline news, weather, sports scores, classified ads, and for that matter, a KCET program guide. If you're watching this program, odds are you watch KCET fairly often. In fact, you will probably watch more than just this program tonight. As a discerning viewer, you need information on what you choose to watch in a city with 17 broadcast television stations and a number of pay stations. Teletext can give you that schedule information, as well as critical assessments of your viewing selections at the touch of a button. As you can see, the program following this one is Shakespeare's Richard II. I can also flip to a page which gives a detailed assessment of the Shakespearean play. It will even tell you when the program repeats if you can't watch it tonight. To have a program guide, news, and other information available at your fingertips whenever you want it is a very convenient and valuable service. But teletext can be more than that. All of us who work in television are painfully aware that it can be an unsatisfying medium, especially in its ability to examine important issues of the day. On the positive side, television allows us to experience and witness events as they happen. We can literally see the news as it is happening. But on the negative side, because of the limits of time, we simply can't provide the detailed information concerned citizens require to deal most effectively with the problems a particular issue raises. Let's take one example. A new law regulating rents has been passed in your community. The passage of this rent control law is disclosed to you on the news, and both those in favor of the law and those opposed are briefly interviewed for their comments on the potential impact of the law. Because of the limitations governing any news show, no matter what its format is, those interviewed can only speak in generalities about the effect of the law. But that probably does not satisfy all those concerns of everyone who has a stake in this issue. Whether we are landlords or tenants, we'd like to know exactly what this new law means to us. Teletext could provide those answers, and it would do so in an instantaneous and convenient manner. Certain pages of the Teletext magazine could be devoted to explaining whatever provisions of this new law applies to our particular situation, what kind of apartments are exempt, what the allowable rent levels are, and so on. It could also tell which city department to call for more information, and it could provide the names and phone numbers of whom to call for assistance. You could view these pages either during the program or, as I've done here, or you could look at them after the program, whenever it's convenient. This is just one example of how a service like Teletext can be used to make the connection between the breaking news story and how it will affect our individual lives. Frankly, in an increasingly complex society, that's no small achievement. We'll demonstrate some Teletext applications of even greater complexity in just a few minutes. But first, let's complete the second series of the KCET Teletext test. Please follow the same procedures as in the first series. If you see something unusual, as described earlier, mark the box labeled yes. If you see nothing unusual, mark no. Test period number six. Test period number seven. Television is watched by virtually every child and adult in the United States. Believe it or not, the average American household watches television in excess of six hours a day. Television, therefore, has a tremendous influence on our lives, and this would seem particularly true of children. Public television with Sesame Street, Electric Company, and many other children's programs has made a great effort to offer more and better programming for children with an emphasis on providing not simply entertainment, but an educational experience. But however good these programs may be, they offer only a passive learning experience. Until recently, there has been no practical means 
whereby the child can respond to the information provided by television and participate in a two-way exchange of information. But teletext offers a dramatic opportunity to allow television to provide a truly interactive experience, a dramatic opportunity to expand the minds of our children, not simply glaze their eyes. To do this would not be difficult using teletext. We would simply combine the interactive nature of teletext with the audiovisual attraction of a television program. For example, if we were broadcasting a children's program, a children's science program, the program could pause at various intervals to quiz the child on information provided within the program. Which planet in our solar system is farthest from the sun? A, Neptune, B, Pluto, or C, Saturn? I think that's fairly simple. B, Pluto. My answer is incorrect. For many years, we've been taught that Pluto is the most distant from the sun. However, that fact is no longer true. Let's try again. We'll try C, Neptune. As you can see, it could be a lot of fun. The program would then continue, only to pause again to provide more interactive experiences. One could devise more complex interactive programs, not unlike some of the computer-assisted programs used in some schools. In fact, teletext could be used in conjunction with small computers, like this one, to provide a continuing series of interactive instructional programs for home use. There is one other important application of teletext I'd like to show before we continue our technical tests. A very important but simple service would be to provide a captioning or subtitle service for the hearing impaired, as you see here. Captioning could also be offered in various languages. In fact, a number of language translations could be provided at the same time. This would be a valuable service not only to those who require the translation to understand the program, but also for people who want to improve their proficiency in a language. You could request Spanish captions as a way of expanding your Spanish vocabulary. Let's now proceed with the third series of technical tests. Remember, if you see something unusual, mark yes. If you see nothing unusual, mark no. Test period number 11. How does teletext work? Well, it's really very simple. The television picture is composed of hundreds of horizontal lines. To be specific, 525 horizontal lines. These lines, which contain the picture, are traced continuously, 30 times each second, moving from the top to the bottom of the screen. When the part of your set which traces these lines, which is called an electron gun, reaches the bottom of the picture, it must shift back up to the top to start over. This shift takes a fraction of a second. During that blink of an eye when the shift occurs, the television station is broadcasting nothing, and your television is receiving nothing, blackness. This minuscule bit of blackness is called the vertical interval. You've seen the vertical interval. In fact, you've likely seen it many times and with great annoyance. To many people, it's known as the roll bar because when the vertical hold on your set is not adjusted properly, the picture starts to roll. And when the picture starts to roll, the black bar appears. Here it is right here. This narrow black band, the vertical interval. The vertical interval is black because for the most part it contains no information. It's wasted space. Teletext is simply a way of using that wasted space to send information. Now you can see why it doesn't get in the way of the picture, because it isn't part of the picture. If we look closely at the vertical interval on this monitor, we can actually show you teletext in action. It's right here. This rapidly moving stream of bright blips moving across the screen. It's called a data stream quite simply because it's a stream of data moving from one place to another. Pages of teletext, once prepared, would be fed into a computer. The computer would then code them and insert the coded data into the vertical interval and be transmitted to your home. When the coded data reaches your home, the process is reversed. The decoder, doing just what its name implies, then transforms the coded data into pages displaying the information you have selected. Like I said, it's very simple. Let's move now to the fourth series of tests we'll be conducting tonight. As before, if you see something unusual, mark yes. If you see nothing unusual, mark no. Test period number 16.
At this stage, you're probably wondering, when is teletext going to be available for public use? It's a good question. Teletext will probably not be available for another three years or so. The reason is that there are a number of steps that must be taken before it can be offered to the American public. This test is one of them. We also must convince the Federal Communications Commission, which regulates the television industry, that teletext is indeed a viable and valuable service. The Commission must not only give the industry permission to offer the service, it must set technical standards to ensure its quality and compatibility with existing television services. In the private sector, the manufacturers and distributors must be persuaded that a product can be manufactured and offered at a reasonable price. And finally, teletext proponents must prove that it's worth the effort, that they can offer a variety of sophisticated and effective services that no one else can provide. Services which could be offered to the home, to students, and to various business and professional users. This will all take a good deal of time, and it will not be accomplished without discussion and debate, disagreement and compromise. Not all people who have been introduced to this technology are enthralled by its potential. Some feel it is nothing more than futuristic gimmickry. Others insist teletext will be as marketable and as universally used as electronic calculators are today. Next is the fifth and last series of test periods. Remember, if you see something unusual, mark yes. If you see nothing unusual, mark no. Test period number 21. We've now completed the last of our five series of tests, ending the first public test of broadcast teletext in this country. We thank you for being a part of this experiment, but you're not done just yet. There are just a few more things we'd like you to do in order to make this test as meaningful as possible. At the bottom of the questionnaire you just filled out, you will notice that there is space allotted for you to write in your name and address. Fill it in if you wish, but you are, of course, under no obligation to do so. What we would urge you to provide us with, however, is your zip code. We're encouraging you to do this because correlating the zip codes of respondents with the nature of their responses will enable us to better estimate the quality of the television signal you receive. Information which will in turn let us better analyze teletext potential impact on broadcast signals in a wide geographic area. After you've completed your questionnaire, please rip or cut it out of the newspaper and send it in an envelope to KCET Teletext Test. 4401 Sunset Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90027. And as is not unprecedented in public television, we're asking you for a donation. But this one is a very small one, 15 cents. or the cost of the stamp, we ask you to affix to the envelope containing your test responses. We're grateful to each and every one of you who joined us tonight, and we hope that having learned more about teletext, you're as excited as we are about its enormous potential. Implementation of a teletext service here in Los Angeles is still some distance down the road. Right now, what we have is a new tool, and that tool will only be as valuable as the uses created for it. But there has never been a tool created that didn't ultimately have many, many more uses than even its inventors thought it would. What we've done here tonight, with your invaluable help, is seized an opportunity, taken a lead. We'll be continuing our work with teletext over the coming months, to fine-tune broadcast teletext to the point where it will become a practical and useful addition to our television service. Just how practical and just how useful, we're only just beginning to find out. I'm Richard Jingris. I thank you for your cooperation and wish you all a good night. This program was made possible in part by a grant from the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations.